class is about has instrumentation in the title. We've been working mostly with electrical instrumentation most of the semester, but there are of course other types of instrumentation we'll run into in lab work and especially being physicists. There's a lot of research that's done at low pressures using vacuum systems and then also low temperatures. There's two groups on our campus using liquid helium. Um, there's definitely the liquid nitrogen tank and stuff. And also, um, like in my lab, we're concerned about vibrations. If you're doing anything with optics, trying to reduce any of that environmental noise. So I just wanted to touch on some of these topics briefly today. Um, these won't be on the quiz or anything, but uh, you should be aware, like, if you're getting a physics degree to, uh, of these concepts. Um, so, working at low pressure is a common uh, concern in many experimental techniques. And the way I think about, like, wh what systems are measured or when do you have to work with a vacuum system um, are, I usually think of it as, like, where will gas molecules interfere with your measurement or your technique? Because working at low pressure means there's less molecules there. If you think of PV equals NRT from your chemistry classes. Um, reducing the pressure reduces the number of molecules present. So um, I think Robbie was talking last week about using the sputter system in the Moore Center. If any of you guys are working with thin films, I know many groups in the physics department are doing that, where you might have some substrate where you're trying to deposit a thin film of metal or like in Professor Cash's group, like semiconductors, um, different materials on a substrate, like atomic layer deposition. Um, or metal films, you don't want um, whatever your metal is here, down here, you don't want it like deposit, uh, uh, you need to be able to have it evaporate, so you have to work at low pressures um, with thermal evaporation or sputtering. So this is an example over here of like uh, thermal deposition where you're heating up a metal and at the low pressures it enters the gas phase and deposits on the substrate. Um, a lot of measurements of spins of electrons um, or working at electronic or magnetic phenomenon, you have to work at low pressures um, so any gas molecules won't interfere with your type of measurement. Um, and also uh, in more of the chemistry field or uh, biochemistry people, field, people measure the masses of ions to deter determine what different molecules are. Um, so that's a technique called mass spectrometry, and I have a schematic shown here where this is actually more of um, physics and also I think in electrical engineering where they have a resonator. You can see here these are nanomechanical resonators, so it's kind of like a little balance that's resonating back and forth. And when something lands on it, it adds mass to it, that resonating will change. So to be able to deposit these particles, what they're showing in here is depositing some virus particles. You, they were measuring the mass of individual virus capsids. Um, you can't have a bunch of gas molecules getting in the way or gas molecules landing on your resonator. Um, so these are just some examples of when you would be working at low pressure. So you can see they have helium here. We'll talk about that of lowering the pressure. You can see different pressure ranges here. And they're going from higher pressure and working down to lower and lower pressures. And that's part of working with vacuum techniques. So up here at the top, I have the pressure conversion table where you see the different units that we use for measuring pressure. But with vacuum techniques, there's kind of cutoffs of using roughing pumps to be at 10 to the negative three tor, high vacuum, and ultra high vacuum. And as you're going from lower and lower uh, pressures, you're decreasing the number of molecules that are at those pressures. So this you can see in this little cartoon, they have this little box or this cube sketched here. And if that cube is a centimeter cubed, uh, this lists the number of molecules that will be in that cube um, at the different vacuum ranges. Uh, so working with those, decreasing the number of molecules that um, are in a certain volume reduces the mean free path of the molecule. So um, the mean free path, I have the definition here, but it's how far a molecule will travel before it collides with another molecule. Um, so at those same pressures that I showed on the previous slide, you can see that at um, the rough vacuum that it'll go uh, 10 to the negative fifth millimeters or 
Yeah. And it's so not very far. Uh, at high vacuum, it'll go five centimeters. But if you're at that ultra high va uh, vacuum, it can go kilometers before a molecule will run into another molecule. So when you're at this ultra high vacuum, you're in a molecular flow regime. So the particles aren't having um, their mean free path. They're not colliding with other molecules to direct their, uh, uh, their diffusion path compared to the viscous flow regime. Um, so this is where molecules pre interacting and colliding with other molecules will then cause them to push and change their diffusion direction versus the molecular flow regime. So that's something to be aware of if you're at an ultra high vacuum that's considered molecular flow. Um, so when you're working with vacuum systems, always a concern is like, where is the gas located at? Where can it be coming from in addition to just where the gas that's originally in your system? You um, usually have an atmospheric pressure at the start and you pump it down with a vacuum pump, but there can always still be um, gas just permeating through the materials and the rubber that you have in your system and diffusion and looking for leaks. So that's always, an issue and something you have to always be checking for if you're working with a vacuum system is, are there any leaks anywhere? And in the same way that when we've been working in lab with uh, electrical circuits and your circuit isn't working and I say go by um, resistor and connection by connection and check each one, that's a similar way what you do with a vacuum system. You have all these tubes connected, all these different chambers. Let's start on this first chamber or this first connection. Is it okay? Um, if it holds vacuum, then move on to the next one and the next one to I, try to identify leaks. Um, also, if any of you guys have had a flat tire or something using like some soapy water or there's very specific um, gas leaking uh, materials that can, or supplies that can be used to detect leaks in the experimental system. Um, so in here with this direction to a pump, a normal vacuum system, if you're trying to get to high vacuum or ultra high vacuum, will have different connections. So if you have a chamber up here where you're trying to get to high vacuum or ultra high vacuum, you will first have to pump it down from the atmospheric pressure to a rough vacuum pr pressure with a roughing pump. So you can see that here and the roughing valve will connect. So you would spend some time letting that roughing pump run. And then after that brings the pressure down to a certain level, you would then close that off um, and then use your high vacuum or ultra high vacuum pumps, which we'll go over different examples there. You can open those up to your chamber. So it's always done in series where you're slowly bringing the pressure down to what you need for ultra high vacuum. Um, so there's different types of vacuum pumps that can work in the rough range, this high vacuum, the ultra high vacuum range. So the rough vacuum, you can see here some scales of uh, how these different ranges that they could work at with the pressure and tour and which ones work faster. This rotary vane mechanical pump is faster than a dry mechanical pump and the like. Um, so it's a balance between how much you want to spend on your vacuum pump, how long you have to wait, what pressure you need to get down to, um, if you don't need to get that far down, you might be able to just use a dry mechanical pump and the like. But most of the rough vacuum pumps are all positive displacement pumps where um, you will be changing, collecting some of the gas in the system, then closing that off um, from your chamber and then displacing that gas so it exits and then repeating the process over and over again. So an example of this would be an oil uh, sealed rotary vane pump. So you can see there's oil um, down here. The gas would then enter. So this light blue color is the gas from your system um, that would be connected to your chamber. And then you can see this black bar here would then displace this, would then rotate, dis displace the gas. So then it's isolated from your system. Um, and then you can, the sun rotates again and then the gas will exit um, over here where it's compressed. So you're always changing, causing a pressure differential. So you can collect some gas from your system and then displace it out, isolate it and then displace it out. 
So oil pumps are quite common. Um, you really have to be careful with checking on the oil that's in there, make sure it doesn't smoke. Um, but there's also other pumps that might be a little bit more expensive, but it might be nice if they don't have oil, you don't have to worry about that. Um, so this is another example of a vacuum displacement pump called a scroll pump. I grabbed this animation off of Wikipedia where you can see like the rotation here um, as it has a spiral is changing the volume. You can see that gas will be able to enter here. And then as it scrolls through, you can see this inlet it's compressed as it rotates, it'll then let the gas exit. So you're always causing these changes in the uh, volumes here to remove the gas from your system. Um, this plot here is just showing how fast uh, you're displacing that gas, how you're changing your pressure, um, and the speed that eventually uh, you'll reach some limit that it slows down as your pressure is decreasing. So you'll get to a certain point where the roughing pump uh, reaches its limit at these lower pressures, and then you have to close off um, the roughing pump chamber and then move on to your high vacuum or ultra high vacuum pumps. And these work in a different way where you're getting more at that um, molecular regime where you're accelerating these molecules from one portion of your pump to the other portion of the pump based on some different physics. So we'll talk a little bit about the ion pump, the cryo, cryo pump, um, diffusion pump. So on this slide here, you can see that a vapor jet diffusion pump up in the, in the upper right is always just kind of showing what they would look like physically. If you walk into like Professor Dow's lab, um, he might have one of these. Um, that as there's a pressure differential and using some of the laws of fluid dynamics that these molecules will accelerate towards the area where there's less, um, less molecules present and then they'll be able to accelerate and uh, be displaced out of your system. So that's based on fluid dynamics and pressure differentials, but you can also charge your molecules as well with an ion pump. So here's an example image of this. Um, I won't read through all of this, but you're gonna ionize the gas that's in your system, and then you are gonna use some electrical charge differential and have a cathode or an anode, um, where your ionized gas molecules will then absorb onto your cathode. Um, so you're absorbing those gas molecules based on electrostatic interactions um, between the two. Um, and then finally, uh, an ultra high vacuum technique that I know is in Professor Gav's lab and Professor Rule's lab is using a cryo pump. So you'll see those signs that say like the coldest place in Cleveland because they're using liquid helium. And this is by bringing the temperature of your pump down so low that the gas molecules and the water vapor, um, helium, hydrogen, or I guess the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the argon that's in the atmosphere will actually condense onto a surface because they're so cold. So they're actually entering the liquid phase instead of being in the gas phase. Um, and that removes them from your system. Um, so that requires bringing these gases down to very low temperatures in your chamber. So you have to use cryogenic liquids to reach those temperatures. So here in this table, you can see um, the boiling points at one bar, atmospheric temperature, um, for different liquids, which you'll see most commonly. Um, liquid nitrogen, um, if working at 77 Kelvin is adequate, or liquid helium and different isotopes reach uh, different temperatures. And you can even reach even lower temperatures than 3.2 Kelvin to below you can get to millikelvin temperatures um, if you keep decreasing the pressure of your system with your liquid helium. Um, so depending on how low the temperature, how sensitive the measurement you're doing is, you might have to get the more expensive uh, helium-3. And I always think it's interesting in the news that they'll talk about that there's helium shortages at times and supplies of helium change and that can influence like these very sensitive uh, physics measurements. Um, so if you're working with these cryogenic liquids, you may have seen like our liquid nitrogen doer, this is a liquid helium doer that's in the first floor of Rockefeller. Um, and these are stored in doers where a doer means that you have this vacuum 
uh, area between the outside of the container and then where you're storing uh, your cryogenic liquid. And this is because vacuum is such a low, um, has such a low thermal conductance that we don't have the issues of the outside of this being cold, that it insulates the helium and uh, keeps it in the liquid phase there if you have the pressure correct. So they're typically transported and um, supplied in these large doers that are rolled off of um, air gas um, supply company. But if you need to get some liquid nitrogen for your measurement, there's smaller doers that are available in labs. And in everyday type of doer, if you want to keep a hot drink hot or a cold drink cold would be a thermospot over. It has the same concept of having this vacuum chamber around where it's storing uh, your liquid inside. Um, so that's what I wanted to go over with um, the vacuum pumps and working with these cryogenic liquids. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, so then I just also wanted to briefly mention um, vibration isolation as well. So this is a figure from Thor Labs where they're showing lots of sources of vibrations that can be a source of environmental noise. Um, so similar to how we were drawing sketches of the noise spectrum of um, with environmental noise at 60 hertz for electronics um, and the kilohertz and megahertz regimes for uh, radio signals, there's vibrational sources of noises where we can say, okay, this environmental noise occurs at 4 to 20 hertz or 5 to 100 hertz with different amplitudes. So um, just like when we work with electronics, you can describe that noise spectrum in terms of vibrations as well. So you can see here, this is uh, the upper floor building of just being on a higher floor introduces um, environmental noise. That's why you'll see most optical labs um, in basements of buildings and physics departments. Um, I think Professor Strangi's lab is one of the only optical labs I've seen like on a fourth floor of a pretty old building, but I know when he was getting his lab set up, like he had them do measurements of the elevator going up and down. How much vibration did that introduce and could it be isolated? And um, that a lot of determining this noise um, in the environment you have to think about in designing your lab, even like, yeah, the pressure differential between um, since you're we just talking about vacuums, the inside of your lab space versus the outside of the lab space. Um, so to try to avoid these sources of environmental noise, um, many experimental setups are on optical tables where they are on a floated legs that have a gas supply. So then it can detect any vibrations and correct for that. So just like we have our um, frequency response function with our electronic filters, you can have a frequency response function for your optical tables to determine what vibrations that they allow pass and which ones they filter. So you can see that we could go into a whole bunch of detail of like the cut cutoff regimes based on different spring constants and different air pressures on these optical tables. And like I mentioned, there's a lot of stuff where if you don't, have an optical table you can also think about your lab design as well because like with this environmental noise like when I was designing my lab you don't want to put something right under an air handler. I spent some of my colleagues in grad school spent a month trying to find these weird vib weird signals oscillating signals from their measurements and they found out it was when the air conditioning turned on it was right above their optical table and was blowing and having air uh, make their camera vibrate. So thinking about those things uh, can help avoid uh, environmental noise there. So this is just an example of what is doing the work with an optical table. You may see like the breadboards that I showed on slide one right here. Up here, this isn't doing much of the vibration isolation, like underneath the metallic part, it is like a honeycomb structure to try to reduce the noise. Um, but a lot of the work is the legs here. So you can see that um, there's these little paddles here where this foam portion would be in contact with the table. So in this cartoon here, these sensors are touching the table and they're on a lever. And if you push on the table, it will note, it'll detect that change in the distance 
and then it will have uh, this reservoir of some gas here. It'll push on a piston or a rubber diaphragm. It's literally like a balloon that your optical table is sitting on and it will increase the amount of gas there and correct and push the table back up. Um, so that's just a little, you can see there's a gas sensor here, um, but that's a little bit of info about vibration isolation as well. Um, so that's most of what I had. Any questions at all?